Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really glad uh, to have this opportunity to, to speak to you. I wish I could be there. I've never been to India. I'd like one of these days I'd like to go. Um, I mean, if, if people have questions during my talk, it's okay to interrupt me. I think uh, uh, I cannot see people on people really raising their hands on on, uh, on Zoom. So just just interrupt me, and I'll we'll, we'll, uh, I'll answer the questions. Okay, so uh, let's get started. Um, and now, oh, here we go. So. First of all, let me, let me say a little bit what this talk uh, or these talks, because uh, it's two hours, it's going to be a marathon, uh, are about. Uh, it, it is not a, a full uh, review of all of the SUSE results from the LHC. Uh, I'm, I'm only going to talk about uh, the our party conserving SUSE. And the reason for that is, uh, in my mind, uh, if we don't have our party conservation, SUSE loses uh, it, its most compelling its real motivation, which is uh, uh, providing a, a nice explanation for dark matter. And then to me, it becomes yet another BSM theory. So I'm going to, I'm just going to talk about RPC Susie, uh, our party conserving Susie. And then also, uh, once you introduce our parity violations, all sorts of things can happen. And so the theories become so vast that just about any search you can, uh, you can imagine it can be thought as, a, as an RPV search. So I'm going to concentrate on RPC, RPC SUSE, our parity conserving. I will be showing some results and some plots here and there, and I'm going to almost exclusively use CMS. And the reason why I, I use CMS is not because uh, CMS is better than Atlas, although I love CMS, <laughs> but it's because uh, I know it the best, uh, so I know I know where to go and find the, the the right plots to make the point that I want to make. And at the end of the at the end of the day, it really does not matter very much which uh, which plots I use to make the points. And uh, for each, for every plot and result that I show, you can just imagine that somewhere there is a similar plot and a similar result from Atlas. I mean, there, I think. Uh, one of the things that we, we learned over the past 10 years is that the results from CMS and Atlas are, are, are very com uh, comparable. Uh, one particular day, uh, CMS may be a little bit ahead and another, another and then the next uh, month, Atlas may be a little bit ahead on some, uh, on some uh, subject, but uh, the bottom line is that they're very com comparable. I'm not going to talk about theory uh, by the way, uh, the, the slides you're seeing, this is slide number three. Is that you see the slides, okay? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, so I, I, I'm not going to talk about theory. I understand that it's being covered by, uh, by others in, in this workshop. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the statistics that we use uh, to, um, to interpret the results. Uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's quite complicated and quite sophisticated but I, but I think you had a there was a talk uh, on statistics yesterday I will also not talk about the detectors we're just going to assume that by some magic the detectors are there and they're giving us pretty good data and uh, I'm aiming this uh, this presentation to uh, to people that are just entering the field or have entered it not so long ago and so they're not uh, so experts in the field. So I'm going to try to give uh, to give a, a, a broad broad introduction, including some uh, some uh, uh, historical facts, some historic some history, because sometimes uh, from history you can learn you can learn a few things by looking at uh, how we got here, how we got to the to where we are now. Okay, uh, so. Here's my outline. Uh, I will make a few comments and I'll talk a little bit about uh, searches and in general, very general. Then I, I said before that I will talk a little bit about history. So I'm going to I'm going to mention the the uh, expectations that uh, that existed for uh, for the search for supersymmetry before the LHC came online. I will talk about uh, the, the, the cross-section for SUSE processes because they are obviously a very important uh, part of the whole uh, experimental program. The cross-sections uh, uh, cross 
coupled with the luminosities that are available, really drive uh, what, is, what is possible and what is not possible. Then I will talk about models. Um, then I will explain to you uh, what, this, what, the, what these limits plots look like. If you go to a, to a typical uh, SUSE review talk, you get bombarded with various, with all these limits plot, limit plots. And it's good to try to take one of them and try to understand you know, what, what it really means and what, uh, what it, where, where, where it comes, where, where the results come from. And then I would take one particular analysis uh, that is a fairly complicated one, uh, an analysis that I know uh, very well because uh, my group was involved in it. And we're going to go into a little bit more detail on how uh, this analysis, which is a typical analysis for the, uh, the LHC, is carried out to give, uh, to give you a flavor for what you need to worry about if you do uh, an analysis of this, of this type. And then, of course, I, I will conclude with some uh, remarks about uh, the future. Okay, so if you want to do a, a, a new physics search, whether it's SUSE or not SUSE, you need a whole bunch of ingredients. The first thing that you need is a detector that works and a machine that delivers luminosity. Uh, we are very fortunate that uh, both CMS and ATLAS are working extraordinarily well. And also the LHC is working extraordinarily well. Then, uh, then there is the trigger. Uh, as you know, we can only record a very small fraction of the events that, or, or the collisions that occur uh, at the center of our detectors. And so you need to trigger on the stuff that you're looking for. Uh, one, one, little, one mantra that I like to give my students is that if you didn't trigger on it, it's like it never happened. It just gets lost. And so having, having, so if, if you want to design a, a, a search, whether it's supersymmetry or, or, or not supersymmetry, or for, for, for that matter, any analysis that you do at the LHC, you have to start by thinking at the trigger and making sure that the trigger that is set up is uh, is there to uh, deliver the data that you want. And if it doesn't, if it's not set up to do that, then you should probably start your analysis by figuring out how to uh, get, get the trigger to work for what you want to do. Then in ser searches are really an analysis of background. So backgrounds are everything. And so you need to understand uh, very well both the, the standard model backgrounds and the instrumental backgrounds. Because at the end of the day, what you're going to do in these searches is really compare what you see with what the, um, what, uh, the standard model or, or the in instrumental backgrounds give you. And in order for a search, in order to discover something, you need to de demonstrate that what you're seeing is inconsistent with uh, these other sources. And then uh, uh, there's an important thing that you uh, need to keep in mind, uh, that if you look for something, you may not find it because maybe it doesn't exist, but if you never look, you will never find it. And so looking for things is, is important. And there is a, there's an interplay and, a, and sometimes a little bit of tension between uh, searches that uh, are model independent and searches that are model dependent. And, uh, I will come back to that a, a, a little bit later. So the roadmap for a search uh, is, is laid out in this slide. And as you know, the first thing is that uh, you have to keep in mind that the most important, that the search is an analysis of the background. So you have to decide what to look for. Uh, you should pay attention to the guidance from the theorist, but you should not go overboard. Don't press the theorist too much, and we'll we'll see we'll see some examples later. Uh, you need to define your trigger and you define your event selection, and this is most often done with Monte Carlo signals and Monte Carlos of backgrounds. Uh, you should probably you should probably be careful not to overtune what you want to do on a particular model. Uh, Unless you're looking for a very specific signal, uh, you should not. You should try to avoid overtuning. Also, especially in, in SUSE models, because SUSE, SUSE signals, because most SUSE signals are such a cover such a broad uh, um, swath of possible final states and possible kinematical regions that you want to 
that you don't want to, to zoom in too too specifically you want to you want to keep yourself a little bit uh, open to maybe seeing something a little bit different from what you expect and uh, you should keep it simple especially the first time uh, and uh, of course as i said since uh, the search is really um, an analysis of, of patterns what you need to do is always uh, keep an eye on the background at every step and if you can uh, if you can avoid the usage of monte carlo blindly where you just run a monte carlo and you use that to estimate your background you should probably think about doing that uh, that's a it's always a good thing to do to try to be as independent of monte carlo assumptions as possible i like to i like to tell i like to say that if mistakes are made i rather make the mistakes myself than have the theorists make the mistakes for me by giving me a monte carlo that is not working Okay, um, another thing that, that is important is uh, that uh, in many of these searches, you get to the point where very rare standard model processes can, uh, uh, can contribute and you have to pay attention to them and they can add up. And there are some ex examples of that. For example, UA1, which was uh, the experiment at the uh, SPPS uh, at CERN in the 80s that, that discovered the W and the Z boson, also discovered supersymmetry in, in 1984, discovered in inverted commas. And the reason was that they, they, they had events that they could not explain, but they were actually coming from uh, all sources of uh, what at the time were very rare and unseen standard model processes. Half an event here, half an event there, and pretty soon you have enough events to cover to, to, to cause you to make a mistake. So you, you, need, to keep <clears throat> you need to keep track of these uh, rare standard model processes. And in, in this case, sometimes all you have is Monte Carlo because you, you've never measured some of these processes. For example, in some of the, in some of the analysis that, uh, that I've been involved in, it turned out that the production of, of uh, four top quarks, two top quarks and two anti-top quarks in the same event were a significant backer. This is a process that was never seen before, and we had to take that into account. Uh, if you knew physics is a mass peak, like on the top right here, uh, it's, uh, it's probably, you know, at least it sounds like an easy analysis, although uh, there is a, a sad history of making mistakes in finding peaks uh, that are not there. Uh, one one uh, technique that many people use is to have a control, say, say the red here is, the, is a background and the green is the signal, and there is a control region there's a control region and then there's a signal region and you use the control region uh, to extrapolate with, with, with Monte Carlo with some other tricks into the signal region. If you, are, if you are in a situation like this one where your signal, this, by the way, can you see my ar the arrow here? Can you see my pointer? Yes, we can. Okay. So, so this, uh, this case is here on, on the bottom at the, at the hardest one when you have a when you have a con when you have your background and then your signal that are occupy pretty much the same the same region and the separation is not as clear and then you really need to uh, to to have a good control of the shape and the normalization of the of your backgrounds of your red curve here and then uh, one thing that has been uh, become standard over the last I would say probably twenty years is that the analysis are blind which means that you you do everything, and we don't. You don't look. Uh, you don't look at your final signal regions until everything is set, and then uh, uh, you you open the what I like to call the cookie jar and see what cookies you have. And uh, and this uh, this is this is not a guarantee that you don't make mistakes, but uh, it uh, a lot, it uh, certainly minimizes biases. Okay, so SUSE searches are categorized, categorized by the final state. So we have uh, searches in z with zero. First of all, the number of leptons is a, is a very big uh, 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 type of categorization because leptons are, are not so, are not so uh, um, common in the standard model. And so we are, and, and it's an easy way to categorize different, different final states. So 
we do searches in, with zero leptons, with one lepton, with two leptons. In this case, the two leptons can be of the same sign or can be the opposite sign. Some, some cases uh, having the same flavor, so EE versus mu mu or tau tau is important. Uh, multi leptons, so greater than two leptons or, or photons. Uh, then uh, there are searches that are characterized with having uh, that can have taus uh, in the in the in the final state. Uh, some measure of the hadronic activity. This could be the number of jets or the sum of the the sum of the PT of of the transverse momentum of the jets in the event. Uh, you can uh, look for events with big quarks or without big quarks, uh, with boosted objects. Um, and of course, in, if you're doing a, a search on a SUSY search with uh, R parity conservation, some measurement of the, of the missing energy is missing momentum is, is, is important. Now, one thing that has happened, uh, and I, I didn't expect it to happen, but it has happened over the last, over the, the last years is that the searches have evolved to become very complicated with the categorization of events very fine in their kinematic properties, especially, especially in CMS. I think in, in, in Atlas, it's a little less so, but now a, a CMS uh, SUSI search could easily have hundreds of uh, what we call signal regions. A signal region is just a, just a category of events that you're looking for. And uh, we will see an example uh, of, uh, of this in, uh, in the case study that I will go over later on. So we have many signal regions. And uh, what's, what's good about having many signal regions? What's good is that uh, it gives a comprehensive coverage of unknown signal. You can, you can have a signal that, uh, that, uh, that you're not explicitly looking for, but that you are likely to, you might be able to capture it by having this, uh, this very comprehensive coverage. Also, Susie, Susie final states are not simple final states with say like a, a mass peak or anything like that usually. And, uh, and so the, the phase space of the Susie, uh, the possible Susie signals extends over a, a broad range of kinematics. Of kinematics. And so by, by making several signal regions, you effectively make a, make a shape analysis. You just ana analyze the shape of the, of, uh, of the data in many dimensions, and that can really help uh, uh, with your sensitivity. Another, another as, I, as I mentioned before, another advantage of this approach is that uh, these searches become, uh, become almost signature-based. Basically, you, you end up uh, looking for different signatures, and you can constrain, or if you're lucky, discover something that you were not necessarily looking for when you started up. Now, of course, there are in some cases uh, uh, some signals that are uh, that are very characteristics, and especially if, if they're if they're very well motivated, it pays to just focus the search on that particular final state with that particular kinematics. But even then, having many signal regions help. Now, the type of the type of searches that we've done at the LSC over the last uh, ten years or so have. I've always been uh, with, with models in mind, and uh, it, it is something that uh, that was not that was a little bit controversial, at least at least with some people. Uh, this is a, a slide uh, from Henry Frisch uh, from University of Chicago at the at the conference 2009, and Henry was my postdoc advisor, so I, I have a very soft spot for Henry. But Henry here was, was just arguing that uh, we shouldn't worry too much about models and we should just go and uh, look for things that, are, that a standard model cannot uh, uh, account for. And, uh, you know, he makes a point. He has a point here where he says experimental papers dependent on a model do not age well. 20 years later, one could use the data, but the comparison with models are junk and diminish the paper. For example, trion protodynamics. I have no clue what trion protodynamics is. It must have been something that uh, when, uh, when Henry was younger was, uh, was uh, uh, hot for a, few for, uh, for a few months. 
And then uh, Henry also says that particle theorists do it better. And we as experimentalists should concentrate on communicating the results and working together. And uh, well, I think, I think Henry has a little bit of a point. It probably goes a little bit overboard, but uh, effectively, as, we, as, a, as I will show you later, uh, some of some of these searches, even if they're not designed as uh, modern independent searches, have actually a lot of uh, a lot of reach for for different models. Okay, so what 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 happened before the LHC turned on? Uh, it, it was actually quite fun funny because uh, a lot of theories just assume that uh, L, that uh, Susie would be found. And what they were worrying about was whether we as experimentalists or we as a community could actually figure out uh, what, we were, what we were seeing. So the, this was called the inverse problem. So there were paper here, supersymmetry, the ILC and the LHC inverse problem, solving the LHC inverse problem with dark matter observation. Theory page LHC and, LHC and the inverse problem. It is quite possible that the LHC experiments would make a five sigma missing energy discovering with the first hand and inverse pico bar and a well understood data. The challenge will then be to begin disambig disambiguating the lookalikes. And there were also workshops that were run and there were a whole, uh, things called the LHC Olympics where uh, uh, Monte Carlo SUSI data was, uh, was, uh, was, uh, was generated and given to various teams to try to sort out uh, what, uh, what, uh, what the signals were. So it, it, it's interesting to see what, uh, what, the, what, the, what the conventional wisdom was uh, 10, 12 years ago. There was really a, an expectation that this would that supersymmetry would just jump out at us and we would see it and then all, and then the name of the game was going to be trying to figure it all out. This is a, this is a plot from a paper from uh, before uh, the LSC turned on. And uh, this is, uh, what this is, uh, is a plot of uh, M0 versus, versus M a half. Uh, we'll talk about M0 and M a half in a bit, but these are the, uh, the, uh, the, the scalar and uh, and fermionic masses in the theory at at high end, at high mass at high mass scale, and this is the, this is the sixty eight point nine sixty eight percent so the one sigma confidence level prediction of uh, based on uh, based on uh, I'm not actually not sure what it's based on because it was wrong obviously, uh, but it was based on the on the results. Uh, on the on the results that uh, that were available at the time and some uh, and some hopefulness i guess and it didn't take very long for for these uh, predictions to be falsified so this is uh, this is a cms result uh, at 7 tv very early on with about one inverse femtobarn of data uh, i think this was uh, the uh, yeah, this was the alpha T search. So this is a jets plus missing ET search, the very first jets plus missing ET search. And you see that uh, in this, uh, in this uh, plane, it, it already it basically excluded everything down here, okay? Which is basically here. So uh, the expectation met reality quite quickly and uh, what people expected to see uh, just didn't happen. I remember I remember sitting in sitting in talks where people in conferences where people were were talking about uh, the fact that uh, the LHC was going to discover supersymmetry in the first forty minutes of data taking. Okay, it it didn't quite happen. Uh, may I ask a question? Yes. Uh, so so uh, a very standard characteristic here seems to be that people predicted that, for example, the left-hand side plot here, the outer curve is one femtobarn at 14 TV, and you seem to have ruled it out already with one femtobarn at 7 TV. So the LHC, all the LHC experiments performed way, way better than any of the uh, things that were sort of uh, claimed before it started, because I remember the maximum Gluino reach was two TV at that yeah. time. And now yeah. we're already beyond that. I think we're 2.5 or something. Right. So right. So, so let's see. I, I don't know. Uh, 
I think I'm not sure. I'm not sure that. I mean, I'm I'm not sure that I'm not sure where this where this came from. Uh, I don't know. Oh, that's okay. But, I but, was just wondering clear, if there was. Clear, but it's clear, right? I mean, here it says, uh, well, one femto barn at fourteen TV. It was here was four hundred and six fifty. Hmm. Four hundred and six fifty. So we they didn't we didn't quite get to that with one femto barn at seven TV. So they weren't that far off, but they were. Okay. Fair. Yeah. Okay. No, I was just wondering if there was really some some breakthrough that was unanticipated that made this big change, but maybe not. Uh, no, I think I think one surprise uh, one surprise was uh, this is this was a missing ET plus jets uh, uh, final states. Uh, so this particular analysis was based on a quantity on, a, on something called alpha T that is not used very much anymore which was designed to really kill uh, the QCD backgrounds. I think people were very scared of the QCD backgrounds, but then it, and, and then you, you will see, in fact, my, my, uh, my test case that I go, I'm gonna go through is a missing ET uh, plus jets analysis. Uh, and you can you see that it's actually, it's actually un, under control. So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that one, one, I guess that one of the surprises was how we could, uh, Take get the uh, missing ET uh, plus uh, jets uh, background and under control and understood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Some of the searches uh, looked very easy, and in fact, uh, they would have been easy if uh, if uh, so. There's something in the chat now. I see. No, just I made a comment. It's yeah. okay. You can the strategy multi yeah, but this this uh right they they do give an edge now, but this particular this particular and and also the 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 parameter the breaking breaking the whole breaking the whole phase space in many many signal regions also helps tremendously. But that particular analysis that we were looking at a minute ago, this one, uh, this was still very simple. I think we may have had only one or two signal regions. I can't remember, yeah, but it was very simple. There were three signal regions or something. Like yeah, that. yeah, something like that. So uh, some of the searches looked very easy. Uh, so here's, a, here's a, a typical one. This actually was uh, was looked upon as uh, one of the best ways to measure some of the SUSY parameters. This would be when you have a you have a chi two zero that decays into into two leptons, and then if you take them with a with a lepton in the middle and a chi one in an LSP over here. And if you take the mass of this of the two leptons that you see, you would see a very sharp edge at the at the right at the right masses and the difference at the mass difference between the chi two and the chi one. Of course uh, this this, this uh, did not turn out to do that be that way. I mean if, if the signal had been there, yes, it would have been easy to see. But it, it was it's definitely not there, at least uh, not at them. Uh, masses that we have access to. So uh, the the bottom line is that uh, uh, the SUSI searches are not simple. We're not uh, we cannot find uh, uh, supersymmetry just by turning turning things on because uh, the parameters of of supersymmetry, if supersymmetry exists, uh, are not the what the ones that people were hoping they would be, which were. Uh, Squarks and gluinos of a few hundred GeV. Now these are the cross sections uh, for SUSI production at the uh, at the LHC. These this is a, this cross section are at thirteen TV, and uh, you can see two uh, uh, categories: the production of strongly interacting. Uh, uh, Supersymmetric particles like uh, squarks, uh, uh, squarks, uh, and gluinos, and uh, particles that are produced uh, only through the electroweak interaction, so exinos, winos, leptons, and so on. And as you as you might expect, uh, the of course the strong interaction, the strong interacting particles have much higher cross sections. They're over here, and the electroweak uh, particles have much lower cross sections. They're over here. Now to set the scale. Um, this uh, this line corresponds to 14 events produced in run two. Uh, in run two, this is before you get all of the uh, branching ratios and so on, loss in branching ratios and so on that you might expect. And this is uh, this line corresponds to 1400. So uh, so you might you immediately you see 
uh, if actually this this pro this plot probably should extend past 2000 uh, you you see that uh, for uh, um, uh, for uh, uh, strong interacting particles uh, you can probably uh, like gluinos here this blue curve you can probably get past the, you should be able to get the sensitivity past about 2 TV whereas uh, for uh, for sleptons for example you're stuck uh, in this area now an interesting thing from this uh, from this uh, uh, plot that you can see is actually that the biggest cross section is the production of squark a squark and a gluino at the, in the same at the same time and this these are these are actually uh, for whatever reason these are actually uh, final states that we do not address directly uh, I don't think it as we will see I don't think it makes a lot of difference in the in terms of the of the uh, conclusions that we draw from the analysis that we perform which are usually interpreted in terms of uh, gluino pairs or squirt pairs so for a student it's in you know, when I when I show this plot to my students, then I always ask them, "Why is that? Why do the why do the cross section fall off?" Which uh, everybody takes for granted, but I always I often find that my students really do not do not know why the cross section fall off. So I'm going to spend two two slides talking about it. Um, so you start out with a with a parton parton cross section, a cross section for parton i plus parton j goes to some final state x, and you call that sigma hat. And so if you want the cross-section for PP goes to X, you have to convolute this parton parton cross-section with the parton distribution function, which looked like this. And one, one of the characteristics is that the parton distribution function, especially for the gluons, but also for the quarks are very, very strong, very, very high at, slow, at low X, where X is the fraction of momentum carried by the parton. And so then this equation can be rewritten as in this way. And it's interesting, it's good to introduce this quantity called the parton parton luminosity. So the, which is a luminosity for parton parton collisions. It's dimensionless. It's a function of the parton parton square root of hat, square root, sorry, S hat. Uh, and so the cross sections are, are proportional to this uh, parton parton luminosity. And if you want to get it into units of, uh, of cross-section or units of area, you multiply by one over S or something like that, okay? So what do these look like? Here's what they look like. So the luminosity, so if you want to, if you want to think of it as the brightness of uh, part on part on interaction, this, so these are glue on glue glue, and these are QQ fall off very, very, very steeply with energy, okay? So uh, you have, uh, even though you start out with, uh, uh, I don't know, this one is 14 TV. Uh, the, the, most, of, most, of your, most of your interactions, most of your luminosity is at much lower, a much lower energy. So this is why, this is the fundamental reason why the, lumino, the, the cross sections uh, fall, fall off this quickly. Of course, the cross section also, uh, just the parton parton cross section also um, eventually has to fall off like on dimensional ground like one over s. But this this loss this this, this fall off of the parton parton luminosity is one of the things that drives the cross section and makes high high mass pro production of high mass particle particles uh, of small cross section. And as a consequence of, of of the fact that the luminosities are falling off so quickly most of the production of new particles is um, near threshold. So you, the particles are produced with momentum, which is uh, typically uh, the same as the mass. Okay, so now let's talk about SUSY models. SUSY is not a unique theory. It's a family of models. And uh, in, in, the, in the early days, people were talking about benchmarks. So here's a paper from 2002. Uh, which nine with 952 citations so it, it was a very it was a paper that was uh, uh, was very influential in the field at the time in terms of driving the, the various studies and people were talking about the benchmarks where you and what what that what this means is that uh, you take uh, uh, 
a model that which is which is defined at very at a very high scale, and then uh, you uh, evolve it down to a to a, a lower scale or to the scale of uh, of our experiments, and uh, and uh, the interpretation of the models was in terms of this constrained minimal super super, super symmetric model, extension of the super symmetric model, which has only five parameters. Uh, uni uh, universal scalar and Gagino masses, M0 and M1 half. That's what was plotted uh, here. That was uh, M0 and M1 half. And then a, and, uh, soft breaking parameters is zero, the, the ratio of Higgs doublet vacuum expectation values and the sign of the Higgs Minsky parameter mu. So, just, so all of SUSY was the, what can, could be explained in these five parameters. And the way to, of interpreting the results was to just uh, make curves into this plane. Now, this way of thinking about SUSY, this way of thinking about our searches was abandoned very quickly. Uh, as, maybe a year or two after the after the, the after the sister had taken data in uh, and uh, it was replaced by this concept of simplified models that have been driving our uh, our work for the last uh, decade so what's a simplified model a simplified model is a uh, is a is production of a SUSY particles the cross section is well defined is defined uh, by uh, by QCD or or electroweak physics, uh, but the model is, is simplified. So, for, so you see, for example, here you have a, oops, you have a, a, the protons are coming in. There is a blob here because the blob is just saying, you know, let's not pay too much attention about what's going on in here. Um, oops. And then uh, this Gruino, uh, goes to a, a three-body decays on the left, the top, the top left uh, plot here. What happened to my mouse? Oh, there it is. This Gruino then goes to, to a B, a B bar, and a and a and an LSP. And the other Gruino also goes to a B, B bar, and the LSP. So all the, in, this uh, simplified model in most cases have a 100% branching ratio. Uh, they almost always, or probably always, actually neglect uh, a lot of details like uh, spin factor, matrix element dynamics, uh, the, 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 the decays are taken as, uh, as, uh, as from phase space. So it's very simplified. It's a simplified uh, picture of what, might, what goes on. And there are a whole bunch of them. So this one gives you uh, a B and, a, and an LSP. This one gives you a B, a W and an LSP and so on and so forth. So we, we made a, so people invented this whole uh, series of models. And uh, these models are definitely unrealistic. This is a, these are not true models, uh, but uh, they take out so this, a lot of the model dependency and the assumptions that are built in in the CMSSM, for example, where everything is evolved from a, from a high scale. And they capture the, the gross features of what, the, what these events would look like fairly well. Uh, they allow you to zero in on the mass shell physics. So you're talking now, you're going to be talking in terms of the masses of the gluinos, not in terms of the of the of M0 and M1 half. Uh, they they help motivate the searches. And uh, they, you can, they can actually be compared with more realistic models and they actually not do so bad. And I'll, I'll get back to that in a minute. So we 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 present our results and our results have been, uh, have been all uh, limits in, uh, in simplified models. So it's interesting to look about, look at, the, at what, what, one of, what one of these limit plots will look like uh, and, where, and where things coming from. So I'm taking this example, this is a product, production of stop quarks, goes to top LSP, okay? And this is the type of, uh, of uh, plots that you see. So what, what are we seeing here? The color map, gives the cross-section limit in Pico Barn as a function of uh, these two parameters of the model. The, two, the only two parameters of the model are the mass of the stop and the mass of the LSP, okay? So over here, at each point, you have, a, you have different uh, kinematics, so different acceptances, 
And therefore you get different limit. If you don't see a signal, you get different limits on the top map, on the, on the cross section. And so this column map just gives you the limit on the cross section, okay? Everything to the left of the black line, so everything here is excluded using the theoretical calculation for the cross section for stop core production. And everything to the left of the red lines is excluded on a, is expected to be excluded on average before you do the experiment. If you if you think that uh, well, if you if the stop quarks did not exist, okay. So as you move in this direction, the cross section decreases, and so at some the cross, the theoretical cross section decreases. So at some point. You don't find events, you don't find a signal. At some point, you run out of events, and therefore you get uh, you get limits around here. So in this case, about twelve hundred GeV. And then over here in this region, as you see, the limits. See, see, this is our orangey. It means that the limits are not as strict. This is what we call a compressed region when there is a small difference between, uh, the, say, the stop and uh, the stop quark and the top quark and Plus the LSP core, plus the LSP. So this is the mass, of the initial, the initial state particle, and this will be the final state particle. So there's not a lot of, a lot of mass difference between initial state and final states. And uh, and here I take, I've taken two points. I've taken this point here and this point here. So they have the same stop mass, but they have a different uh, LSP mass. And you see that the transverse momentum of the LSP. Is very different, and the transverse momentum of the LSP was what was, was gives you the missing energy at the end of the day, and so you see that in this compressed area here, for this point blue point, you 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 tend to have uh, uh, the, the missing energy tends to be smaller, and so it, it becomes more difficult to distinguish from standard standard model. So this is why you you lose you lose uh, sensitivity over here, and then your your curves always look something like this. They sort of turn around. As they got to the uh, to the kinematical limits, but this is not the full story actually, because uh, you could have a, a point here that is excluded, meaning that the cross section that you that the cross section that you limit that you set is smaller than the cross section from the step for for Susie stops, but you can still have an excess. And so it's interesting to, to not just look at those, at those at the plots that you usually see, but you look at also look at plots like this one, which is a plot of, this, of the significance of the observation. So in this area, for this particular analysis here, so over here, it's yellowish. So it means that you have about uh, half a sigma to one sigma excess of events. Uh, um, that uh, are consistent with the, with the kinematics associated with events from, from, from over here. And over here, you actually have a one, one sigma deficit of events. And here you have a couple of sigma excess of events. And so actually, there's, there's much more to the story than this simple plot here, because you can look, you can look in here and you can see whether, there, whether, you have, whether there's something else going on uh, in your analysis, the excess that you see could be come from some other BSM process that has a lower cross section than the than the than the stop uh, quark uh, pro, like the, the stop pair production that you're looking at, and the deficits are interesting as well because uh, it could be that something is wrong with uh, with what you've done if you have a deficit. Uh, I think I've lost this. Okay. Uh, so this is a, 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 an overview of the results that we that we have so far. Uh, so these are different uh, different Gruino models, uh, and depending on the Gruino models, you can have we have set set limits between one and two TV, uh, and you see limits using zero lepton final states, one lepton, two leptons, and so on. Um, these are uh, these are uh, squark models. Stop and bottom also about one TV, and these are the these are these are limits on uh, electroweak uh, 
processes like a Chargino, Neutralino, and so on. And in this case, the limits are, are much smaller. Now, one thing that is interesting to look at is to try to figure out how real are these limits from the simplified models. So uh, this has not, this has not, it's not been comp comp this analysis has not been completed for run two, but I'm going to show you some run one results this way from Atlas. So what Atlas, in this paper, what they do is the following. They take a model, which is called the, the phenomenological MSSM, which is an r parity conservation model. It has no new CP violation. It has, a, it has minimum flavor violation. It, it sets the LSP to be the lightest neutralino. Uh, and then it takes the first two quarks and leptons to, uh, gen of this first two generation to be mass degenerates. So what they end up are with phenomenological, phenomenological models with 19 parameters, and they scan 310,000 of these. And then for each one of these models, they, they see whether they were, these models were uh, um, eliminated or by, uh, by, the, by their uh, analysis from run one, okay? And then they made plots like this. So this is, a, this is a plot where they take all of the models and they look, uh, they look at the Gruino mass from in that model and the LSP mass. And, uh, and then they see what fraction of these models are actually, would actually be excluded by their analysis. And so black, when, when it's black, it means that 100% of the models were excluded. And, and the, this white curve is the curve that they, that they obtained from this particular analysis here of a Gruino to quark quark uh, LSP. And, and you see that, uh, yeah, you know, it, it's not perfect. This is, a, this is another one. Uh, this is uh, for squark production. This is for slepton production. This is for bottom and this is for stop. Uh, the, coverage, the coverage of the simplified model, it, models is not perfect but it is a pretty good representation of, uh, of what this uh, uh, PMSSM will, uh, will, will suggest. So when we say, when we say that uh, based, on the, based, on the, um, based on the simplified models, we exclude a Gruino mass below, I don't know, in this case, uh, 1400, MEV, uh, 1400 GV. Uh, this, is, this is a statement that is not, exactly precise but it but it does capture the uh the the, the main feature of what a susie model might be so there are definitely there are definitely uh loopholes in this uh in this model in this simplified models but uh it was actually very uh good to see that uh, the coverage that you get from these models is is pretty representative of what it should be from a, a much more, a much broader and less, a more complicated picture. Uh, I said that uh, uh, that there's more, there's, there's more to uh, to limits than uh, than these plots here, right? Than these plots here, and in fact, uh, this is an interesting paper that that came out uh, uh, after uh, some after after the beginning, the, the first few analyses of, of for run two from CMS came out and Atlas came out where these people took, took, our, they took our results, they looked carefully at our results and they, 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 they identified a possible, uh, possible excess, of, excess of events. Uh, so what did they say? Applying, a, applying our techniques to two CMS plus JETS plus MET and SUSE searches, we identify a search a set of overlooked three sigma excesses. Among these four excesses survived test of inter and intra search compatibility, and two are especially interesting. They are largely overlapping, et cetera, et cetera. And then they proposed a model to explain uh, this, uh, this uh, excess that, that showed up in some of the SUSE searches. And then this, ex this model was actually uh, studied uh, with more data. And um, unfortunately, it was not confirmed. It was just a a statistical fluctuation. So this underscores the importance of not just uh, providing limits on these uh, uh, limits on the uh, on the simplified model, but to give uh, to give the community enough information to um, 
to take take our results, take the results from the LHC, and uh, and try to apply them to other to other BSM uh, ideas. And so there's been a lot of uh, a lot of activity in this area <clears throat> over the last ten years, uh, starting with having simplified simulations. Then um, a move towards pro providing maps of efficiencies, simplified regions to understand things better, and uh, and most most recently also background covariance matrices that that a theorist can then use to try to uh, reinterpret the results that come out of Atlas and CMS. Okay, so then my, then my next thing is is a case study, and so maybe maybe we can take a. A five minute break here, and if you have any questions, since uh... sure, okay. So, do any of you have any question to ask the speaker? Can you raise hands? Not a, not yeah, a Nishita, question. Please. Yeah, not a serious question, but since you mentioned reinterpretation, and thank you for mentioning that, uh, it seems there is a big gap between uh, the reinterpretability of Atlas and CMS searches. And part of that is simply, as you mentioned, CMS searches are far more complicated than Atlas ones. Uh, but uh, what is your, uh, I mean, what is the general feeling inside CMS about this? Are people more willing to give more information out now? Um, I think it's, uh, I, I, okay. Um, this is Sushita is asking me this question. Uh, it's uh, yes, Nishita. Nishita. <laughs> um, can I be? Can I be not so diplomatic? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. when, when, I think when I when I was Susie convener of CMS, I tried to I tried to uh, push the 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 group into giving into giving more and more information. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I was one of the people that pushed uh, towards uh, giving the covariance matrices, for example. Right. Uh, that really helps. Actually, we are we are in the process. Of, so, I, so I'm a phenomenologist, a theorist, and we are in the process of implementing that in our code. Right. 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 Oh. I think I, th I think it's uh, yes. So I pushed very hard, but then uh, but then I left. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, then, uh, then, uh, and so it, it, it's really. So you see, the thing is that it, it, it takes it takes effort, and so it takes uh, it takes people uh, people to continue to push. And mm -hmm. uh, I moved on to sort of other things, and uh, and uh, I'm afraid that uh, things may have may have uh, decayed from there. It sounds mm -hmm. like they have, from what I hear. Right. No, it's just a lot of effort. We understand that completely. I mean, unless there is something that incentivizes people to do this extra work, there is no reason for them to do but, it. But actually, actually, you know, the way the way it was done, it was it's been set up uh, by a, a, a couple of really good people, and it's actually not that much effort. Mm, okay. But uh, but I think uh, that a lot of people still do not appreciate how how useful this is. And this can be because uh, because it it uh, it gives uh, it gives what you've worked on for ye for a, a long time very hard a lot more shelf life. Mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And it's not you know it's not that difficult right now, but uh, when people get to the end of the marathon, <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Actually, one practical issue which was happening more recently is that the searches are taking a long time to get out. Yeah. And by the time even people move who know the actual details of the analysis and who could yeah. do such work. Which is actually worse, right? Because especially yeah. if they leave physics, especially if the younger people uh, find a job elsewhere, then it's just lost. Nobody knows what has happened. So this actually happened with, uh, with us when we were trying to reinterpret a CMS uh, 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 displaced lepton search, uh, which is that uh, there was a conf note and it never made it to publication because the person left and nobody could extract the efficiencies out of it. So for for three or four years, uh, we were just stuck with uh, with the eight TV results, even though the thirteen TV partially was out there. It's out now, so that's good. But yeah. But I know Seema, you've been you've been there you've been there. Uh more more recently uh, yeah, what's, yeah. what's going on what's going on 
So earlier, even I did myself, right? I provided a lot of things for outsiders. But even within CMS, so I have some of the students who try to interpret, for example, some of the soft stuff and all for the CMS yes. searches only. It's difficult to get information because people get busy and just one, yeah. one analysis doesn't help people to but go to their next job. Yeah, people so they think, have to figure I, out. Yeah. I think people people don't appreciate our, our, our that that that's that that, that that it is important and and you know when they get to the end as Sima knows very well when they get to the end they have to deal with all this um, stuff about uh, the paper and the yeah so it's the, becoming complicated yes and uh, so, they, they're yeah. just overwhelmed yeah so in the beginning when I joined here at ISA six seven years ago I mean I had some of the interpretations done by my students the undergrads yeah but no more <laughs> we couldn't move get to the end. So it's even within CMS, I think we face problems. So I can understand what Nishita is saying. Yeah. Okay, there is one more question by Gagan Mohanty. Yeah, sorry, I may not stay back till the end of your uh, uh, meeting. So that is why I wanted to ask this uh, little bit provocative question. So please pardon me if I... So, um, the point is, unlike let's say Higgs model, where you had a clear cut, uh, you know, kind of binary uh, answer, you have Higgs or you don't have Higgs. Uh, definitely, supersymmetry doesn't belong to that class of model. Correct me if I'm wrong. So, you know, sort of, can you tell me that the fact our theory colleague were too excited that, as you said, uh, past 40 minutes, I, I forget what is the word you said, 40 minutes or, or past one hour, Suji will be there and some people will go to Sweden and it didn't happen, okay? So where thing might have gone wrong is that, uh, you know, the, the way we know Suji, the, the way people thought Suji is, you know, very strongly, I mean, you know, so is that the one or is that a, a, from experimental side, we we have missed this Luca-like model that somehow the, the signal is there deep underneath somewhere, and we didn't uh, we haven't found a clue to 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 get to that. So I, I don't know if I made myself clear. So so your question is uh, wh why why is it that people were so convinced? No, I, I'm saying that where things could have gone wrong is, is that uh, the the theory that what people thought that 40 minute we should find uh, that that concept, like the way they thought probably that is not the right thing or even something is that thinking is correct, but in the data it is uh, the signal maybe somewhere it is, you know, look-alike uh, of, of something that we're, we might not be able to identify. That's what I mean. Well, I mean, you're saying, you're saying maybe, maybe it's, maybe it's there and you haven't, and we haven't seen it. Yeah. So, so I, yeah, I want what, to hear what, your opinion. What, 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 I, I will talk about some of that uh, towards the end of this, of, of uh, the second part of the talk. So maybe we can take it back then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fine. Fine. Sorry. I, then I'll, I'll stay a little longer. I have to go somewhere, but thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Shall I take, shall I start again? Yeah, fine. So here uh, I wanted to go to a case study, which is uh, an inclusive search for BSM physics, uh, mostly SUSY, in a fully hadronic sample with missing transverse momentum. Uh, I picked this analysis because I know it, because I worked on it, uh, not because it's the, it's, it's the best or anything like that. Uh, in fact, this analysis also looked for disappearing tracks, but we're not going to talk about that. Okay, so it's an inclusive search for... Uh, for uh, uh, adronic states with no, no leptons, okay? So, so we need to figure out how to characterize the events. And so we, one, one way of characterizing the events is how many jets are there. So there are some possibilities, there's some possible SUSY model with lots of jets. So here's a, uh, a Gluino to, t to top, anti-top LSP. So this uh, could have a, you remember, each top can go to three jets, so this is the twelve could be twelve jets and miss and plus missing et, or it could be just quark production. There will be two two jets plus missing et. So the the search is very inclusive and it requires and it it uh, characterizes the events by the number of jets. Then in some cases we have big quarks, in some cases we have no big quarks. So on the number of bees is another uh, variable that characterizes the events. 
Uh, then another variable that characterizes the events is how much, uh, how much energy, how much hadronic energy is there in the event. And we use this variable HT, which is the sum of the PT of the jets. Here we see some, some uh, we see a couple of, of plots here. So this one, this one in purple is a, a squirk model where, where the, the a, a squirk uh, pair production where the squirk mass was 1400 GV. And then uh, this red one is, a, is also squirks, but it's a B, B quarks, doesn't matter very much, but it's a thousand GV. And you see that there is a, there's a difference in, uh, in the number of, in the, in the adronic uh, activity, which is refl reflects the fact that this one, one model at 1400 GV and the other model at a thousand GV. So this is another way to characterize the event. And then since we're looking for our peak conserving, of course, uh, something related to missing energy, uh, and this could be done with something with uh, this missing PT or with HT miss, which is missing PT calculated based on uh, on uh, uh, on jets only, or with a variable called MT2, which happens to be the one we picked, and I spent a couple of minutes talking about that. But the difference here is uh, so these are plots plots of HT miss. Uh, if uh, if the if the if the uh, model does not is not compressed uh you have a lot of h of, of missing pt or missing or ht miss and if the model is compressed you have uh, a lot less these are uh, these these are log scales so this is a compressed model and you see that it falls very quickly on a log scale and these are non-compressed models and you see that they extend much further out okay so um we use uh, this variable mt2 uh, to uh, characterize the missing characterize the missing ET of the event. So, what is MT two? If you have a if you have one particle dedicated to a visible plus an invisible, like a W that goes to mu nu, uh, you can you would identify the missing PT with uh, the neutrino PT, uh, since you cannot say anything about the longitudinal component, and you construct that pseudo invariant mass, which we call the transverse mass, using only the transverse component and as we can see here this, this for w decays the transverse mass as a, a cutoff at the mass of the w okay now imagine that is that we have uh, something like uh, this so pp goes to squirk squirk and then squirk goes to quark lsp now the pt miss is the sum of the pt of the first lsp plus the pt of the second lsp in vectorially so I cannot build two transverse masses, one for this for the first pair and one for the second pair, which is what I would like to do. So instead, I build an infinite number of pairs subject to the constraint that this, the PT of the first LSP is plus the PT of the second LSP is the PT miss. And then I define an MT, MT2, which is the minimum of the maximum of each pair over all pairs. And it turns out that MT2 is such that MT2 is bound by the mass of the squark that, that, uh, uh, that generated the final state. In fact, MT2 was invented to measure the mass of SUSY particles, but it turns out that the MT2 is a little bit better than PT miss to discriminate events with real, real PT miss like SUSY from uh, QCD backgrounds. And so this uh, is shown here. This is a QCD multi-jet uh, uh, simulation. This is the missing ET, and this is the MT2. And you see that uh, MT2 is always smaller than missing ET, but uh, uh, the, the, the MT2 tends to, be, tends to be pushed down even when, when ET miss is large. On the other hand, for a SUSY model, uh, MTT, MT2 and ET miss are more, are more alike. And so what you get is that uh, MT2 is a, is, a, is a little bit better at killing this QCD multi-jet background than, uh, than, uh, uh, than, miss, than, P, than PT miss. Um, there are some technical details that are not that important. Uh, for multi-jet events, uh, uh, one has to group the jets by hemispheres into two jet-like objects. 
and then uh, these transverse masses are calculated when setting all the invariant masses of the of the jets or the LSP to zero. That's just a technical detail. Doesn't matter very much in the end. So in the end, we characterize the event by these four particles, four quantities: the hadronic energy HT, the number of jets, the number of B quarks, and MT two. These have four properties that are semi-orthogonals, the total hadronic energy, the multiplicity, the B quark content, and of course, uh, the missing energy. Now, there have been uh, studies <clears throat> to try to figure out what is the optimal set of variables and the bottom line to, to do these types of analysis. And the bottom line is that uh, it doesn't matter very much as long as you, as long as you pick variables that preserve this orthogonality, okay? Now, you have four variables, and so now you're, you're, you're breaking this phase space uh, and you slice it in four different directions and we end up having 282 signal regions in this analysis, okay? So that's what I was saying, that we can have a lot, many, many, many signal regions. Then you have to start with the triggers. <coughs> the analysis always starts with the triggers, and so, in this case, uh, we just used, uh, uh, if, if the HT is above 1200 GV, we use uh, pure HT triggers. So we trigger an HT. If it's, uh, if, if it's uh, the missing energy is above 250 GV, we trigger a missing PT. And then there's also a cross trigger, HT plus missing PT that covers this area. And it's just like a, like a backup. So these are, these are the areas that we can cover, okay? So we can only go, go, go down uh, to PT miss of about 250 unless the HT is, uh, is above 1200. Now, after you pick the triggers, you need to figure out how to measure the trigger efficiency. So this is an example of the trigger, of trigger efficiency measurement where we try to measure the, the missing PT or missing ET trigger efficiency by selecting uh, events that were triggered on the, uh, on, with muons. So this is the distribution of uh, missing PT on these muon triggered events. Uh, this is the fraction in blue. We see the the, uh, the events that are also past the missing ET, missing PT trigger, and in red we find, we see the efficiency. Okay, so the efficiency plateaus at about ninety seven percent once you get above uh, two hundred and seventy GV or so, and we and we do the same for uh, for the ET leg uh, and the, and the, and uh, you know and we, so we measure the trigger efficiency with uh, with orthogonal triggers so then then there's an event selection which is simply in, in simplified is the following we since it's a zero jet zero lepton event um, zero lepton analysis we reject events with identifies noise in the detector uh, and we reject events with isolated leptons, electrons, muons, and taus. Uh, we select HT and PT miss in the trigger plateau, so where the trigger efficiency is, uh, is large, greater than something like 97%. Um, then uh, we, we, we ask that the missing PT points away from the four highest PT jets. And this is something that... Uh, kills uh, or reduces backgrounds where the PT miss is coming from mismeasured jets, which uh, when you mismeasure a jets, usually the, the missing PT points in the direction of that jets. Uh, the PT miss cannot be too different from the HT miss. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a safe requirement against trouble that you might get from some noise in the calorimeters, for example. And then uh, against multi-jet QCD events, we also apply uh, a cut on the transverse mass on, on the MT2 at 200 GV or 400 GV, depending on, uh, on the HT. And then, <clears throat> then we, we bin uh, the events. So this is an example binning. There are five HT bins, okay? And this is the HT bin between 1200 and 1500. And there's a binning in the number of jets on the x-axis and then the, the binning on the PT and on the, on the B core content on the y-axis. And you can see how many bins there are in here. Uh, and you can also see here uh, the, the backgrounds that contribute 
uh, we have a Z to new new. It's a it's a, a irreducible background, and uh, Z to new Z to new new plus jets usually does not have B quarks, and so it dominates uh, at uh, at zero B quarks. Uh, the top quark top quark events uh, have a uh, a B quarks, and so they dominate here where there are lots of B quarks. And then the multi jet background, which is uh, so, sort of everywhere, but it's subdominant everywhere. Now, this is bidding in HT, in N jet, and in number of B. And then each one of these little squares is subdivided into several MT2 bins, so something like uh, four or five MT2 uh, bins. Okay, and so when you add them all up, then you get uh, to what is it? What was it? Uh, 200 and 282 signal regions. A lot of signal regions. So, how do you choose the bins? Is it a science or is it an art? It's a little bit of both. Uh, the HT binning goes down as far as we can for, with the trigger. And there's a, one of the boundary is where the pure HT trigger kicks in. So we see here that the pure HT trigger kicks in at 1200. And so this is a natural boundary for uh, the binning in HT. Oops. Uh, the, number of bin, the number of B bins, uh, typically, typically 0, 1, 2, or greater than 3, greater than or equal to 3. 0 removes the top backgrounds. <clears throat> greater than or equal to three becomes very, very small backgrounds because the TT bar only has two, back, two B quarks. Then uh, we bid in NJ, in the number of jets. So we go as high as it makes sense at a given HT. And then uh, the, for MT2, for MT2 the, we pick the a bin size to be about 100 GV. But uh, when we have bins that are too fine, where all, you expect only less than a, about a, an event, in that bin, uh, we just merge them because there's no point in slicing it any finer. And then the highest bin is such that uh, we expect, uh, the highest MT bin, MT2 bin is such that we expect to for the one background event. Okay, so there, there, is a, there is a little bit of thought that goes into picking this, these uh, 282 bins and So the backgrounds, we have a QCD, uh, multi-jets, we have Z to new new, and we have uh, events where, that, where, we, where we lost the lepton. So this would be events with a W to lepton neutrino decay, uh, which could be either PP to W, or, but also PP to top, top events. And if we have a W leptonic decay, there's a neutrino, and then you, the neutrino gives you, uh, uh, gives you immediately missing PT, and so they contribute to the, to the background. Uh, but we, we veto events with leptons, so in order for, for, for these events to contribute to our background, the lepton must be lost, meaning that we don't find it for some reason. So, the three, so these are the three backgrounds, the, the multi-jet background, Z to new new, and uh, W to lepton with a lepton that we cannot find. The QCD multi-jet background is the scariest background. Uh, and it, it is the extreme tail of a very high cross-section process. And it's very difficult to figure out a robust uh, way, which is data-driven, to estimate it. Um, and also, if you try to estimate it by uh, Monte Carlo, it, is, it just takes uh, forever. Uh, you don't have enough Monte Carlo, you don't have enough computing resources, and then you're actually even trusted at that level. So uh, we use a technique called rebalance and smear, which is a hybrid technique, uh, data-driven as well as Monte Carlo. So let me explain what uh, rebalance and smear is. So in a rebalance and smear, uh, background estimation, we do the following. We, we take a bunch of multi-jet events from the data, okay? So these events, usually they, these events have a little bit of uh, PT miss because of, uh, because of resolution effects. So we take these events and we rebalance them and send them back to PT miss equals zero. 
we do that uh, based on the, on the jet energy resolutions. Once we have that, what, what is it that we have? We have a model of the physics of multi-jet events, which comes from the data. We don't need to, we don't need to run a, we don't need to trust Monte Carlo for the, for the production and the uh, cross-section or the kinematics of say 10 jet events. We just take the 10 jet events from the data and then we, and then we use those to model multi-jet events. <clears throat> Then once we have these multi-jet events that we take from the data, we smear the, uh, the resolution of their momenta, the, the, the measured momenta using Monte Carlo templates. So the smearing then is done by hand and it's equivalent to a full detector simulation, but it's very fast and it's under full control so that we can change, we can change uh, things very quickly and see what kind of effect uh, they have. And we can repeat it many, many times. And so we don't have any, an issue of CPU. Then once we have these events, which are rebalanced and then smeared, we can uh, uh, use them to predict, to directly predict the backgrounds in the various signal regions. Now, in order to do that, uh, we, don't, we, we, need, uh, we need events over here. We need to get these events here at, at low PT means and at all, all types of uh, HT. And so we, we use a whole bunch of uh, prescale triggers. And this is uh, how the prescale triggers get stitched together to give a, a smooth uh, uh, HT distribution in, in, uh, in the events. And then, uh, and then we apply resolution templates. And these are resolution templates from the Monte Carlo. So this is the reconstructed PT of a jet divided by the generated PT of the jet. And you see that there is this non-Gaussian tails. And it is these non-Gaussian tails here that end up giving the, uh, uh, the QCD background. And, and you have to be very careful in, in, in getting this right. Even if they are from Monte Carlo, they have several ways of getting this wrong. And so it's a kind of a delicate procedure to get them right. And we do this in bins of PT of the jets, and we do this in bins of uh, uh, rapidity coverage of the detector, and also separately for, for B, B quark jets and non B quark jets. And then, uh, then we take uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, process and we just see whether we can uh, uh, reproduce the data in the sideband. So this is a sideband data. With, MT2 below, between 100 and 200 GV. Our, our signal region start at 200 GV. And these are different bins in HT. And actually you already see that in this, uh, in this region of HTs, uh, the, uh, the yellow, which is the rebalance and smear prediction from the data is actually negligible compared to the, all of the other backgrounds. And it only becomes important at very high HT. And you can see that we, we're following the the data pretty well. These bins are, uh, are basically uh, bin, bins of different jet multiplicity and different number of peak works. Okay, so that's why you get all of these uh, raggedy uh, distributions. Uh, we can uh, we can get another uh, sideband where we, we we require that the pit we invert the requirement on the pointing of the PT miss. We, in the signal region, we require that the PT miss do not point in the direction of a jet. Here, we require that the PT miss points in the direction of the jet to enrich into to enrich the background in uh, in uh, QCD, and uh, we see that it agrees it agrees pretty well. So this actually works fairly well, and so we have it. So we we use it for the for the background prediction. The next uh, the next. Uh, background that we have to worry about is the Z invisible. So uh, this would be, so here's an example of a QQ bar goes to a, a, a gamma or a Z uh, plus two jets, okay? So there are two possible methods. One is to exploit the similarities between gamma plus jets and Z plus jets. And the other one is to simply extrapolate from the observed uh, Z to dileptons. So this is the method that we use. We extrapolate from the dileptons. Uh, there is a, a comp the, the, the challenge here is that the branching ratio for Z to neutrinos is larger than the branching ratio for Z to electrons and or muons. 
And so this is very statistics limited and we have to work hard at it. So the, the, we measure Z2 leptons in various kinematical regions. We subtract off contribution from other processes such as uh, TT bar uh, by using, for example, the EMUs events. We rescale by efficiency factors and acceptance factor to give the, to get uh, Z to new new. And then uh, we take the dilepton PT, we add it to the missing ET in a dilepton events, and this estimates the missing PT in neutrino events. And as I said, the challenge is that the branching ratio for the neutrinos is greater than the branching ratio for the dilepton. So the statistics is poor and we need to do some extrapolation. And uh, well, I, don't, I think I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna, I'm not gonna go into this, into this much details. But suffice to say is that uh, we need to do some extrapolations because of the, to, to, into the tails of the, the various distributions because we do not have enough statistics from the dileptons, and this is, uh, this is the, uh, the most delicate part of the analysis here. Um, but what we use are the shapes of the Monte Carlo limited region and where the background is small to do this, uh, this extrapolation. So this is a, one, one of the extrapolations that we do. For example, there are, <clears throat> there are very few Z plus uh, BB bar. And so uh, we don't have any Z plus BB bar, but we assume that the Z, that in the, in the MT2 distribution is the same in a zero B, one B and two B. And, this is the Monte Carlo tells us that it is the same. And we use the Monte Carlo to, uh, we, we use this assumption that we just verify in Monte Carlo. So this is a, one of the assumptions that goes into these extrapolations that we do. <clears throat> now for the lost leptons, uh, we have, these are W2 leptons where the lepton is not found. So the first thing to do, of course, is to look for leptons very, very hard. We do that. And then uh, we use the Monte Carlo to obtain a, a transfer factor, which is the ratio of the loss to found. Where lost includes uh, out of geometrical acceptance and founds are events in a control region with one lepton. So we get it, we, we have this transfer factor, which is uh, for the one and depends on different and varies uh, from uh, signal region to signal region. And we measure this and we apply it. Then there is a wrinkle that you always have to worry about in all of these analysis when the control regions can include SUSY events. So for example, for example, the one lepton control region can include events like this, where you have a stop quark that then eventually gives you a top quark that eventually gives you a lepton. So this then would, so you, you, you think that these, uh, these leptonic events here are a standard model and you use those events to predict your, your lost lepton backgrounds and this leads to an overestimate of the standard model background. You can deal, you can, uh, you can deal with it in two ways. The right way is to make a joint fit of signal and control regions, but that complicates things tremendously. And then the, the other way is to just to figure out by how much you've overestimated the background and subtract it, subtract it off as a loss of efficiency. Since this effect is pretty small, five, 10 percent, this is what we do, what we do. But when you do an anal a SUSY analysis, you always have to worry about the contamination of your signal re of your control regions from, uh, from the signal itself. And then we have to worry about all of the systematics. Uh, which vary from signal region to re signal region, and they vary from a, from a percent level, 2% to almost 100% in some, in some region. Uh, statistics of control region, transfer factor uncertainties, extrapolations, and so on. And then you need to include all of the uh, uncertainties on the signal efficiency, region by region, signal model by signal model, the V tagging efficiency, the jet energy scale, the resolution, and so on. And this is the sample, this is a sample of our results. 
So this is uh, <clears throat> these are these are regions. They are not three, 288 here because these are regions integrated over MT2. Uh, this is one jet zero B, one jet one B, HT, HT, HT regions, HT region, HT region, HT region. And then you take one of these, like this one, and you blow it up into the MT2 dimension, and you find uh, you find good agreement between data and, and uh, expectation. And this is what a, a particular SUSE, SUSE signal would would look like. It would be typically distributed amongst uh, some uh, some uh, some signal regions. This is a signal. Uh, a particular signal that I picked here is a signal with with uh, gluinos that goes, and each gluino goes to B quarks, and so you end up uh, having many B quarks, and so you populate regions here with B quarks greater than or equal to three B, two B, etc. And the, the regions with zero B is pretty much are pretty much unpopulated by this particular signal model. Okay, so different signal model pro populate these regions in 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 different ways. So this is effectively a shape analysis of, uh, of your battery. And then the next step is that you set limits on the SUSE cross section, and it's done for each signal model. And it's done in a grid of, uh, of uh, pairs of uh, squark, a uh, pair of SUSE particles. So for example, stop uh, and the uh, and uh, LSP for this particular model, you would calculate uh, the uh, upper limit as a function of the mass of the stop and the mass of the LSP. And then you end up uh, having all of these plots, okay? Uh, now, as I, as I was saying, these are, these are, these are these analyses are not just sensitive to SUSE models, but are sensitive to all sorts of other things. So in particular, since uh, leptoquarks uh, uh, became uh, so interesting now, given the, given the anomalies that are showing up uh, in, a, in a B meson decays, we also actually uh, use this data in, and interpret it in terms of leptoquarks. And we actually extracted some of the, some of the best uh, leptoquark limits. From, from this quote unquote SUSE analysis. And so this is just a sample because there are very many of these. And then uh, this gives us exclusions in gluinos up to two TV or so, oops. Uh, in neutralino up to about 1500 GV. Stop and bottom 1700, 1200 and squark uh, about 1200. And neutralino masses, uh, just uh, just 870, 700, and 580, and also leptoquarks. Okay, so this was a, this was an example where I hope uh, I have conveyed the, the type of the type of problems that one has to solve to do one of these analyses and the complexity uh, that uh, that are involved. So now let, let's let's talk a little bit about the future. When I have to predict the future, I'd like to remind myself of this particular crisis, uh, from the great horse manure crisis of 1894, uh, where people were just extrapolating from the number of horses uh, and horse carriages in London. And uh, well, uh, Every street in London did not end up being buried under nine feet of manure because something happened, right? They, no more horses. Now they now we now we have cars and uh, and trams and buses. So predicting the future is hard. This is uh, <clears throat> this is what uh, uh, the evolution of the luminosity. Uh, should look like at the LHC. Actually, this is already this plot is already obsolete. This is not the latest one. Things have been shifted by about one year. But the bottom line is uh, that uh, up to now we have uh, um, about uh, uh, oh there it is an integrated luminosity of about uh, two hundred uh, uh, inverse femtobarn. And we 
expect to go up uh, by a factor of uh, 15 or 20 by the, the year nine, 2039. Now, when I look at this year 2039, I just get scared and depressed, but okay. It's a long time from now. Now, uh, we talked earlier on about the parton parton luminosities. This is another plot of the parton luminosity and that show how fast they're falling. Uh, and I think it's safe to say that uh, the expected increase in the size of the data set will not have a significant effect on the mass reach for discovering new particles, uh, unless there are some really new good ideas. So what's needed is more data, but more than more data, what's needed is, is ideas to look in difficult corner of phase space of parameter space uh, for um, if you if you if you were, if you're thinking about supersymmetry, as we, we are, there, there are there are still some holes here and there that can be that can be filled. So it's Susie dead. Well, Susie cannot be killed because it's not one theory, but it is a framework. So you can always push the masses higher than the current reach of the LHC. But I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, Susie at the TV scale may not be dead, but it is on life support. Xenos had the best hope to rescue, rescue naturalness uh, because uh, for naturalness argument want the Xenos to be, to be light. Uh, but the, the Xenos have, have, have compressed spectra the mass differences between uh, between the three xenostates are very are, are fairly small, and therefore you get your 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 you don't you expect uh, well first of all so these are the these are the diagrams to 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 uh, produce a xeno so this is uh, chi two chi one and then the chi two goes to a z or a z star uh, chi one and the chi one the chi one the charge geno then goes to w LSP. Um, if the if these masses are so small, you're not going to be, be getting uh, on shell Zs and on shell Ws, and you're not going to get very large uh, um, momentum leptons. When when these particles go, decay, uh, when when the when the Z and the W decay uh, into quarks, you you get no leptons, and you pre pretty much swamped by by backgrounds. So what you get because of this compressed spectrum, you get low PT leptons, and you have to you also lose some some efficiency because in order to get enough missing ET, you need to uh, rely on uh, on uh, on these states recoiling against, uh, say, a, a high PT jet that gets emitted from the initial state. Um, so. This is this is these are these are difficult analysis. There actually there's actually been a lot of uh, progress over the last few years in both CMS and Atlas. Uh, in uh, and these are the these are the latest uh, the latest limits. Uh, we gotta be a little bit careful because for was for some reason CMS and Atlas use different plot uh, different things. So in, in Atlas, uh, what's plotted is the mass difference between the Chargino and the LSP. So this mass difference here, whereas uh, in uh, CMS, what we plot is the mass difference between uh, the two neutralinos. So it's between this guy and this guy. So there's a factor of two uh, difference if you assume that the Chargino is in, is in between in this, on this axis. And then there's also a difference on this axis, because this is Chargino and this is uh, Chi2. Nevertheless, what you get is that uh, masses down to a few GV are, are probed in terms of delta the delta M's, but the masses that are probed uh, are uh, still fairly low, uh, 100, 100 to 200 GV at most. So this is this is one place where uh, one expects uh, one expects improvement because uh, because we are really limited by limited by um, uh, luminosity and also I think there, there are potentially better ideas to trigger on even lower PT leptons that could be that could come, come be made to bear on this problem. 
Now, some theorists are confused. Uh, here's, a, here's a quote from uh, Ben Alanach from Cambridge. Um, the trouble is that it's not clear when to give up on supersymmetry. True, as more data arrives from the LHC which no sign, with no sign of super partners, the heavier they would have to be if they existed and the less they solve the problem. But there is no obvious point at which one says, ha, ah, well, that's it, now supersymmetry is dead. Everyone has their own bias point in time at which they stop believing, at least enough to stop working on it. The LST is still going and there's still plenty of effort going into the search for super partners, but many of my colleagues have moved on to new research topics. For the first 20 years of my scientific career, I cut my teeth on figuring out ways to detect the presence of super partners in LSC data. Now I have all but dropped it as a research topic. I think uh, this is a quote from Ben from uh, two or three years ago. Some theorists are more hopeful. Nathaniel is my colleague at UCSB and uh, we were talking uh, we were talking with some colleagues of ours that are working on uh, direct dark matter detectors. And this is what he has to say about WIMPs. WIMPs remain promising because they are one of only a few dark matter candidates to predict their own existence. And also a candidate where that prediction is strongly correlated with discovery prospects. Here's, we, we can draw some lessons from the searches. Uh, Obviously, the conventional wisdom of what the new physics should be has failed. And so uh, do not listen to the theories too much. Uh, more emphasis, I think, should go on unconventional signatures, delayed, long-lived, all sorts of crazy stuff. We should look where we did not look before, or if we can figure out, if, or if we can come up with better techniques, apply new, better new techniques to the old problems. In my mind, because of dark matter, pity miss can be still an effective approach. I mean, but if there's one thing that we know in the world that does not work, that does not uh, agree with the standard model is the existence of dark matter. Another thing that uh, I would keep in mind is that the Higgs is special. It, does, it plays a special role in, a, in the standard model. It's, it is a... a, it is a sector of the standard model that has not been uh, explored uh, as thoroughly as, for example, flavor, although, <laughs> although now we, all sorts of flavor anomalies are popping out. And so I think, uh, I, think uh, using, I think exploiting the Higgs to search for new physics is, uh, is a good way to go. And, uh, and then of course, testing the standard model with more precision. Now, this, I think this uh, may, have, may uh, address one of the questions that was asked in the, in the, uh, in the little break that we had. Uh, you can only find what you look for. And uh, I, I, was, I was on Babar before coming to, before joining the LSC. And uh, we were all surprised in Babar by this huge, huge signal, this one. Uh, this uh, what is this? Is this is uh, this is a decay of uh, of uh, D, D star plus S? The D star S twenty one twelve was discovered, in, and it had a huge mass peak here. And it turned out that this signal had been in various data set for many, many, many years, but nobody had looked because its mass was supposed to be above this threshold here, and so it was supposed to be very wide because it would decay strongly. And so it would not be, we would not be able to see it or study it. And so nobody even bothered to look. And then somebody bothered to look and boom, this thing, uh, this huge peak uh, showed up. So, and why, so if you don't look for something, you'll never find it. And so one of the things that always, uh, always worries people working on, or should worry people working on searches is that you're, that you're missing something obvious that is there because we're not, you're not looking. Uh, on a personal note, this is the stuff that I work on these days. Uh, I'm doing a crazy experiment to look for mealy charged particles at the LHC. I, I worked on a, a search for long-lived particles decaying into two muons uh, 
collected with a with a special trigger. So this is a, this is a create this is on, this is on the crazy side and on the less crazy side, um, measurement precision measurement of the of the Higgs boson that might uh, provide us a, a a window into into the new physics that we are all interested in. So let me conclude by saying that. Uh, the first 10 years of the LSC program have really challenged the SUSY paradigm. I think the experiments and the data analysis have exceeded expectations, but uh, uh, nature has not been kind to us. The additional luminosity that is unlikely to lead uh, to significant progress with the same searches. So uh, I, I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think that we are going to make a discovery using the same, doing the same searches over and over again uh, with more luminosity. And so I think in the future, what we should do is emphasizing the standard modern measurements, particularly those that, are, that involve the Higgs boson, because that, those are measurements that are not, those are, that, that's a sector of the theory that has not been, that is not well uh, uh, tested at all. And we, should, we must continue the exploration, but, uh, we should and we should look everywhere and and uh, maybe not rely so much anymore on theoretical prejudice. Thank you. Thank you, Claudio. It was interesting, and you went to the details of one of the analyses, so it was good to appreciate various points. Uh, questions, please. Okay, there is one hand raised. Is it Sanjay? Sanjay, please. Now it is okay. You were muting. Huh? Now it is okay. Go ahead. Uh, no, it is a, a more of a comment uh, rather than question. So what I was saying, Claudia, you can correct me. Like, uh, if you look at a Tevatron, like uh, there was, uh, it produced uh, more than ten thousand uh, Higgs, but still uh, Tevatron never found the Higgs. Uh, uh, so it, it's possible that uh, given that uh, let's see we have to only 115 percent, 16 percent of one data, still we have to wait a little bit uh, rather than too quickly ruling out when, whereas we are still expecting like a 20 times more data, uh, too quickly ruling out everything based on very tiny data and uh, which uh, already Suji might already have been produced, but it is uh, just under the rock somewhere and we have not uh, we have not uh, it's a hadronic environment is so tough that uh, we probably have to wait a little bit longer uh, just uh, just a comment actually maybe you can yeah i think i think uh, yeah I, I think i think you're right but i think uh, I, I think you know i'm not sure that repeating the same types of analysis like the one i just went through into into, into a lot of detail is the is the way to go I think I think we need we need to do things to, to do things differently because uh, I, you know, um, the the the, back, the background is so large. Uh, I mean, I I just I just don't I just don't see one of those uh, standard analyses to be able to 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 dig out a supersymmetry signal. Yeah, and, uh, at this stage, at least it's a little bit daunting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so. But. Uh, but uh, but uh, it, it is certainly worth focusing on uh, on uh, on the regions on the regions where we are not so sensitive, uh, but they're difficult regions, right? Yeah, that, that's <laughs> true. That's we, true. We, you know, we are not so sensitive, sensitive for a reason. Yeah. At the same time, I feel like on the theoretical side, this is experimental side, but theoretical side, I feel that maybe. There's the the assumption based on which Suzy model is built. Probably uh, you have to relook actually. So this is probably it's not a very natural way of uh, saying like okay, let's uh, start with uh, solving the hierarchy or natural. Let's right, build right. the situation. Maybe you have to change your assumption and build a model which is basically generic rather than based on particular assumption. Yeah. Yeah, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you know, the standard analysis using the standard, uh, the standard object and the standard type of analysis that we are doing, uh, you know, whether whether it's uh, whether it's a uh, whether whether it's a naturalness based model or not, uh, they 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 covered those models. I mean, I think uh, I think a lot of the PMSSM 
the PMSSM studies show that most uh, that, that, that the coverage is pretty good, except in some corners that we know are not, uh, where we know the coverage is not very good. So I, I think I think more than more than the more than the, uh, than additional theoretical ideas. What we, what we need is uh, uh, a, 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 a new new techniques that can go into the corners where we haven't gone before. But you know, but there are corners, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think the first question, one of the questions was like uh, in the forty minutes, first forty minutes, I let you will be found. Uh, I let you will find yeah. uh, Shuji, yeah. but I didn't find. I think. Uh, I, 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 I maybe uh, can correct me. I think uh, given that how beautiful that the theory is and uh, and it uh, kind of like uh, many cases it uh, uh, kind of predicted and was consistent with standard model also. And uh, so uh, people kind of believed it uh, uh, quite a bit. And, uh, but uh, so they were supremely confident that it is there, but yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but it didn't. Uh, life is not simple like a heat in Tabatron, even though That's it is right. produced in a Yeah, That's right. But the plots shown were made uh, much before LHC came online. Oh, yes. So we were doing these studies during 98 99. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. The SUSI studies. I was involved with the trileptron uh, study, simulation studies. Anyway, uh, Ritesh, uh, you have a question? Yes, yes. So it's yeah, please. Uh, can can you speak louder, Ritesh? Yeah, okay. Let me. Yeah. We can't hear you. Yeah, okay. Is it, yeah, now it's yeah. good. Okay, good. Yeah, so the uh, two uh, kind of conflicting philosophical messages that appeared on uh, your uh, during your presentation. One is that, uh, of course, we need to know uh, what we are looking for, or we will miss it. That's one thing. And secondly, is that uh, and, and uh, to do that, I the way I understand is that we need to have uh, an idea of what we are looking, which is like the you know theory motivated searches. At the same time, you said that we cannot completely depend upon theory. So uh, this is kind of a mixed message for me. So could you kindly elaborate uh, a bit more on that? The conflicting nature of this statement. Yeah, I, I think. Uh... Let's see, how should I put it? I think that uh, you, you, you can, okay, so let, let's take, uh, let's take uh, an example of something that I, wor I, I worked on in the last year or so, which is uh, the, the second one here, the search for long lived particles, okay? Yeah. Um, that, that's a very generic thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Okay, now uh, when we then when when we then when then when we wrote the paper, we we interpreted it in, a, in a two or three different models uh, that are that are there because uh, you can they, you know you can make a you can make a model for for for, for everything. So in a, in a sense, uh, uh, a long lived particle that decays into dimuons is uh, is a generic thing. Okay, I got uh, your idea. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the the one the other one the one here at the top this little experiment that we're putting together with some with some friends uh, some people. Uh, okay, we're looking for particles with uh, one hundred uh, the charge of the electron. Okay. Well, yeah, there 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 is a, there are models there that that make it that are models of uh, the dark sector, etc., etc., etc. But it's but but again, it's a very generic signature, right? No, that that's absolutely now, and I understand your, your understand what I mean. Basically, yeah, basically, when you say can't completely trust on theories, basically you mean that usually we many of the study were benchmark oriented, and that is that could be misleading. Yeah, I mean, what what I mean is that. Uh, I mean, when when we when we justify in, in this part in this paper, in the, when we justify this Millikan experiment, for example, that yeah. we're doing, yeah, we you know we 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 start in the usual way with uh, there is this theory out there of the of the dark photon, and if the dark photon is uh, is massless, there can be a mixing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, we're just looking for something there that is very well defined. Yeah. And whether it comes from uh, from uh, from the type of uh, 
from the type of mixing of with the dark sector that is uh, that is in the in some of the papers that we cite on that we that we quote or not, I, I, you know, I don't care. Yeah, you know, okay. you yeah. know what I mean. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Perfect. Thank you. Rita Ja. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the nice talk. So uh, you have uh, mentioned this, but can you repeat uh, how you deal with Susie in the control region uh, in that stop search that you were discussing? So, <clears throat> so basically because of the because of this contamination we we over subtract we subtract too much background okay and so we 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 say we we, we treat uh, this uh, over subtraction as a reduction in efficiency mm, uh, but how do we know that how much we are overestimating the oh yes because uh, because uh, the number of the number of sig so if if you if you if you expect let, let's just throw some numbers there just random numbers right if you expect a uh, hundred signal events in the signal in the signal region let's make it very simple and and you have uh, ten uh, uh, events in the lepton in the lepton control region that come from the signal and the transfer factor is one then uh, you're basically going to subtract uh, 100 minus 10, which is 90. So it's a 10% loss. If you had 200, then it would be 20 and you would be subtracting 200 minus 20, which is 180, still 10% loss. Basically, basically because the, the number of, event, the number of uh, events in the, sig in the control region that come from, the, from, uh, from SUSY is proportional to the number of SUSY events that you would have in the signal region. Okay, so this is uh, calculated from the observed events in the signal. Regions. No, this is this this is cal calculated from theory. Okay. So from just, theory, just the expectation that the, just the expectations, right? Okay. So, so because effectively what you do is you have a sig you have a number of events in the signal region, and then you subtract this the background. Mm -hmm. uh, if if uh, if the if you subtract a number of background events that is like ten percent. Of what's in the signal region, it's all, it's like uh, losing ten percent of the signal. Okay. okay. It's not the correct way of doing it. The correct way of doing it is the, is number one, but number one implies an order of magnitude more complications, and so, and it's not worth it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Next, uh, can uh, Nishita, you want to ask a question still? Uh, yeah, if nobody yeah. else has anything, yeah. I, mean, I, I, I just spoken a that's lot. Right. So I, no, yeah. that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask if you have an opinion about these new kinds of model independent searches that people are trying to come up with. So I know there is music from CMS. And there's a similar search from Atlas, but it seems that their sensitivity is really much, much lower than any of the targeted searches for anything. So uh, are there any nice ideas for, for model independent searches out there? Well, these are not just model independent, but they are really global searches, right? Because they, they, they just search over the whole, the whole uh, uh, spectrum of, uh, of, of final states, right? I mean, yes, yeah. Right, so, uh, the, 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 you know, when, when you do something like that, uh, you, cannot, you cannot zoom in and, uh, and, and, and do the backgrounds at the level that you do the backgrounds in, uh, in, one, in any of these uh, individual searches unless you take it from the individual searches. So, uh, so the, level, the, the level of background understanding cannot possibly be as good. Mm -hmm. I, I think, uh, now I haven't paid, I, I, I don't know what the latest thing, the latest uh, thing about music is, uh, but uh, I think the, the, the original one was 
basically a comparison with Monte Carlos, right? Right, yeah. Uh, and uh, I think uh, most of the searches that, uh, that were done, in, in the, at least in the SUSE group, uh, uh, went way beyond just a straight comparison with Monte Carlo. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that's, that's a fundamental difference. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I see. Okay, I see your point. Mm -hmm. So, so the the much more difficult. I mean, they're they're they're, they're more difficult because of that. Right. So there's there seems to be no easy way of sort of. I mean, the, the original idea is good, right? You look at everything, and then if yeah. you see anything, you zoom in and look a bit better. Oh, oh well, no, in, in that case, I, that part I like, actually. Yeah, know. yeah. I mean, it's I a like, good like idea, it, like, but, but it like seems it that, that everything is uh, so wishy-washy that you don't really get an access. Yeah, that, that, I, that oh. I don't know, because I, did, I, I didn't look. But, mm -hmm. but, the, but the idea of, uh, of uh, I mean, it goes it goes against uh, some of the some of the uh, let's call it the, the religion of, of of blind analysis, right? But uh, but I do think it's a it's not a bad idea at all to just mm -hmm. uh, to just uh, do a global a global look with uh, with tools that may not be the best tools that you have, and then if you see something interesting, then you really go and zoom in. In, in fact, uh, in fact, uh, this was one of the criticisms that was uh, leveled at uh, CMS by by Atlas when CMS started using so many signal regions, because they said uh, you would never be able to uh, to get away from uh, look elsewhere effects and 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 things like that. Now, and and, and you know, and they, they are right at some level, uh, but. Uh, at the same time, uh, their analysis, you know, we, we may have one analysis with 100 signal regions, but they have 10 analysis with 10 signal regions. So at the end of the day, you know, it's not it comes that different. to the same thing. It comes to the same thing, you know. Right. Thanks. Yeah, that, that, that was uh, useful. I don't see any other uh, hands raised. So I think it's uh, getting uh, quite late for Claudio. So let us all thank sincerely for the nice, interesting talk because uh, you started with the basic things and you touched upon some of the like um, pattern luminosity, et cetera. These are very useful for the students. So it was really nice. Very kind of you too. No, thank you for, uh, for having me. This was, was fun. Thank you. Yeah.